Yes, we did. We uh, fill our kids up with sugar and send them home with their parents. It's kind of like payback, you know. <laughs> that might happen today. I don't know. Those kids might be kind of wound up. But just be thankful that they can get wound up. Well, it's time for Christmas. Wow, it comes around soon, doesn't it? Are you ready? You ready for Christmas? Who's not ready for Christmas? That's all right. right. And we get busy. Seems like this whole week, just everything is focused on Christmas. All the television programs are about Christmas. People talking about Christmas. You got, you know, all these people focused on something that took place 2,000 years ago. A little baby born in a manger in a little city that nobody ever really even heard about, of no real significance. But yet today, because of his birth, we have traffic jams, malls are packed, we spend thousands and thousands of dollars on stuff, and, and, and it all goes back to this thing called Christmas. It goes back to when Jesus was born. It's the most celebrated holiday in the entire planet. Billions and billions of people spend billions and billions of dollars on this particular holiday. We have parties, we have events, we go to social things. We celebrate Christmas. But the question is, what makes Christmas so special? What makes it so special? We need to answer that question because the world's kind of lost focus on that. The birth of Jesus Christ is the most significant event in the history of humanity. Time split when he was born from B.C. to A.D., Everything changed when Jesus came on the scene. So we're going to look at the purpose of Christmas, why we celebrate Christmas, talk about the very first Christmas, the birth of Jesus, how these angels came forth from the heavens and sang forth this wonderful anthem about his birth. But we're going to look at three things in particular. Christmas is the time of celebration. Christmas is the time of salvation. Christmas is the time of reconciliation. I laid out the, my outline in your notes in, in the bulletin. Does anyone not have a bulletin that would like to have one? Would you raise your hand if you do not have one? Okay. Glenda does not have one. Can we see that Glenda gets one? And, and Oh, you got one? Okay. Ann? Ann did not get one? Ann, it's good to see you. Man, it's good to see you. This, this is the first time since her accident that she has driven. And she, she drives to church because she wants to be here with her church family. We love you, Ann. We pray for you all the time. It's good to see you. Luke chapter 2 is our text, verse 8. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. At this time of the year, Christmas, we have more parties than any other time of the year. But isn't it ironic that the person that we're celebrating, his birth, Jesus, is left out of most of the parties. Not only is he left out of the parties that we celebrate, the world's trying to push him completely out of his own birthday. Isn't that amazing? Why even celebrate Christmas if you're not going to put Christ in it? Well, Christmas is a party. We need to understand that. Christmas is a party. These songs we sing this morning, song that Yvette talked about, too, she sang, it brings that into focus. Can you imagine the people that looked upon Jesus when he was a little baby? And, and to realize this little infant is going to bring deliverance and salvation to the world. This is God in the flesh and how they must really knelt down and truly worshipped him and, and adored him because this was the king of kings. This was the one that the whole world was waiting for. I think they had a party. You know, I believe Jesus likes party. I like parties. You like parties? He likes to have fun. There's nothing wrong with having fun. Christmas should be a time of celebration. We're having just a great time. You know, the other day, we went down to Roseburg because our grandchildren had some plays that they were doing in the school. And so Thursday, I had, you know, the whole afternoon free. So what do you do when you have a whole afternoon free? You go to the mall, right? Every man loves going to the mall. 
So I had my wife with me and my mother-in-law with me, and I, I, I managed to survive one store. You know, I made it through the one store. And I had a few packages with me, so I decided as I'm walking into the next store, I saw this most comfortable chair. That's a good place for me to sit until they're done shopping. So I'm sitting there, and then they just keep coming out of stores and loading me up with more stuff to watch for them, you know. But I noticed something. As people were walking around this time of celebration, it should be a time of cheer. I didn't see a whole lot of people that were all that happy. If they were happy, they didn't show it. They were stressed out. We went to Macy's, okay? Macy's had this saying, if you go in there before 1 o'clock, it's like 50 to 60% off plus an extra 20%. That's important. And people were running over each other trying to save a dollar, pushing people out of the way in order to get a shirt or a blouse or a sweater or something, trying to save a dollar. And I'm thinking, where's the joy in all this? Where's the celebration in all this? People didn't look all that happy in the mall, but they were out there shopping. Christmas is a time of celebration. Why do we celebrate? Number one reason is this. God loves us. God loves us. The greatest scripture I believe in the Bible, the one that most of us probably have memorized by heart, is John 3, 16, which says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We need to understand something about God. He is love. Not just he loves. God is love. He is what love is all about. And we need to understand something else, that when God created humanity, when he created Adam and Eve and all the people that came since that, when he created you, when you came into this world, he made you as an object of his love. That's our purpose in life, really. God wants to have somebody that he can show his love to. He wants you to know that he loves you. Now, we have a lot of different definitions of love. We got love when you look at a little baby, a child, a parent has for that baby or that child or a grandparent has for that child you have a love for that child you have a love between a man and a woman that you enjoy you have a love that you have with friendship you love people but the love that God brought into this world and Jesus described it as a brand new word he called it agape love agape love is not just that God loves you it's that God is love it is in his character it's who he is he cannot help but love you because that is what he is. And, and nothing that we do will ever separate us from the fact that God loves us. He loves us so much, the Bible says, that he died for us. So we celebrate the fact God loves me. I celebrate the fact, number two, God is with me. And we continue on in that scripture we're going to look at in just a moment. But in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, the Bible says, I will never leave you I will never forsake you the song that Yvette just sang talked about God is with us one of the names of Jesus was Emmanuel Emmanuel means God is with us have you ever felt like you've been abandoned in life you ever felt like you're all by yourself you're all alone there's nobody that really understands there's nobody really to talk to you feel alone do you realize God hates loneliness he hates us so much that when he created Adam, he looked at him and he said, it's not good for man to be alone, so he created a helpmate for him. God wants us to have people in our lives. God wants us to be around people. He wants us to have something called fellowship. But not only that, but God loves us so much that he said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And I want to encourage you as we're coming into the year 2015, if you have felt lonely at all, that you don't have to feel lonely anymore. 2015 can be a great year for you because you can enjoy the very radiance of God's presence in your life. God is with us. Celebrate the fact that God is for us. And I like this. God wants you to win. God wants you to succeed. I've talked to people all the time about coming to the Lord and hear all kinds of excuses as to why they don't come to the Lord. You know, one of the many excuses we hear is people don't want to come to the Lord because they're afraid that he is going to expose all their wrong and all their bad and not only expose them, all their bad that they've done, but he's going to beat them up because of everything they've done wrong. They have this mentality of God that God is going to hurt them in some way. They're literally afraid of God. 
In John 3, 17, it says, Jesus did not come to condemn this world, but he came to give this world life. He's not here to condemn your past mistakes. He's not here to condemn you. He doesn't put you down. God is for you. In fact, God likes you. Did you know that? He likes you. Well, I got an understanding on this. If God likes me, and I like me, if you don't like me, you got a problem. <laughs> right? So, deal with it. To know that God likes me gives me a lot of confidence. Jesus did not come to condemn this world. We need to realize as Christians, we are not here to condemn people either. That's not our role. There's a lot of people out there, critics, on both sides trying to get you to join this cause, trying to get you to join that cause, trying to get you to have conflict with other people. We should never join ranks with that. We are called to be peacemakers. We're called to be people who will bring people together and not to bring conflict. We're not here to condemn anybody. We are here to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into the hearts and the lives of people who are lost and let them know that there is hope and there is joy and there is peace for them as well. That's our role as Christians. God's for you. God's with you. God loves you. We need to understand these things. So the first purpose of Christmas is celebration. The second purpose is down in verse 11 of Luke chapter 2. It says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God does not waste energy on doing things that are unimportant. If we did not need a Savior, God would never have sent a Savior. We need a Savior. How many times have you said in your life, God, get me out of this? How many times have you said, God, I need help? Anytime you say, God, get me out of this situation, God, I need help, you're literally saying, God, I need a Savior. I need a Savior. I need somebody to come and help me out in this situation. So what is this thing called say, salvation? First of all, it's saved from my past. Saved from my past sins in particular. The Bible says in Matthew 1, 21, concerning the birth of Jesus, talks about Mary, says, She will bring forth a son, and she shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You ever wonder what sin is? If I were to ask you to take a piece of paper this morning and write down your list of sins, what you think sins are, you'd probably have a different list than I would. You'd probably have a different list than the person next to you. You know why? Because we have a tendency to write down sin of the other person. And we think their sin is much worse than our sin. And so we can have a different definition of what sin is all about. But you know what sin really is? It's right in the middle of the word sin, S-I-N. It's the, word, the letter I. Sin is an I problem. It's a me problem. I've got a problem. That's what sin is. Sin is I want to be my own boss. I don't want God to tell me what to do. Sin is saying, God, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. Sin is saying, God, I know what makes me happy more than you know what makes me happy. Sin is saying, saying, you can do certain things. Or God is trying to tell me to do certain things, but I'll just ignore those certain things and do what I want to do. Sin is just basically saying, I am God, and I don't need anybody else. Yet we still cry out, God, help me out of this. God, get me out of this situation. Sin is the thing the Bible says that separates us from God. All of our problems in life are a result of sin. All of our problems. Because something, somewhere, somehow, we made bad decisions that separate us from God. Guilt is a result of sin. Guilt is a result of decisions we made in life. But you know what? Jesus wants to come and set you free of all that guilt. Expectations of other people. They put demands on us. This time of the year, you have all kinds of demands. The house has to look just right. you got to buy the right present. You want people to enjoy your food. You have all these, unfo un all these expectations put on you. 
and, and it has a tendency to put you down and put you into depression if people do not say that you have done as good a job as you think you've done. Jesus wants to set you free from that. You don't need to prove yourself to anybody. You've already proven yourself to God, and he said, you're accepted. We need to get rid of a bitter root, a root of bitterness in our heart that comes because of this guilt, because, because of this resentment, because of the fact that we have hatred in our heart. All these saints are like a cancer in our life, and God wants to come and say, hey, I want to take that out of your life. We worry so much. We worry so much. Are we going to get things together by Christmas time? Are we going to have the meal just right? Are people going to make it? We worry so much. I was talking to a guy the other day, and he was worrying about what's going to happen in his future. And he's worried about what's going to take place because he's concerned about his home, if he's going to be able to keep it. And he made a statement in all that worry. He said, you know, I've never really gone without anything in my life. And I told him, I said, you know, there's a scripture that says that. The Bible says that through experience, we have hope. You can look back in your life. I can look back in my life. And all the experiences that we have gone through, all the things that have threatened us, God has taken care of us through it all. We're here today because God has proven himself strong in our life. And if God has done it in the past, God's going to take care of it today. But you can worry about it. You can have anxiety over it. Jesus is coming on the scene. He said, don't worry about anything. Why do you care what other people think? You know, the greatest fear, for example, is the fear of death. You know what the second greatest fear of man is? Doing what I'm doing right now, standing before a public and saying something. People don't like doing that. Some of us, we kind of like it. But it's a fear. Jesus has come to take away the fear of death, to take away the burden of worry, all these things. Maybe you've never considered the fact that you need salvation. But you do need salvation. You need salvation for something in your life. Whether it's any of these things we talked about, or maybe you just feel like there's times in your life that your world seems completely and totally out of control. I can't get a handle on this thing. You know, the Apostle Paul felt that way 2,000 years ago. And he made a statement in Romans 7, 24. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Basically, he was saying, I don't know what to do. I try to do good things. It doesn't happen. I try to do some things. It doesn't work out. He said, life seems out of control. And then in verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, the answer is found in Jesus. We're trying to find something in our life that is bringing salvation to us. We're trying to find something in our life that's trying to get rid of the worry, the anxiety, the guilt unfulfilled expectation the demands on our life we want to find somehow some way to escape all that pressure in our life but yet we have a tendency to look for it in all the wrong places some people say for example if only I could get married I would be fulfilled how many of those of you that have been married for any period of time like to testify to that some people say, well, if only I could get a job, or maybe I can get a better job, or maybe I can just live at a higher level of success, of status in life, then I'd be satisfied. Everything would be great. Some people say, if only I would have a baby, then life would be great. Others of us have said, if only my kids would graduate from high school and go off to college, then life would be great. You're looking in all the wrong places. If only I could go on a vacation to Hawaii and put all this pressure behind me. Just leave everything behind me. You know what the problem is? We're taking the problem with us. We can't go on vacation for any of these things. We're taking the problem with the problems inside of us. It's not outside of us. It's not the pressure people are putting us under. It's not what's happening around about us. It's not our environment. The real problem is right here inside of us. If we don't have peace with God and joy in our heart that only he can give, then the whole world is upside down. And if that is true, then we do need a Savior, don't we? We need somebody to come and rescue us from this, this horrible situation that we think we're in in life and give us peace in our heart and give us life once again. So we need to be saved from our past. We need to be saved from our sins. It's not found in a pill. 
It's not found in anything else. It's not found in a place or a program. It's only found in a person, and that is Jesus. Saved from your past. Saved for our future. When Jesus saves us, he not only washes our sins away, he gives you a plan. He gives you a purpose in life. 1 Timothy 1.9 says, Who shall save us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before time began, God knew that you were going to be on planet Earth at this particular time in history. He knew that you were going to be sitting in this church December 21st, was it, 2014. He knew you were going to be here. He knew, he knew you before you were even born, but he also had a plan for your life. He has a reason for your existence. He's got a purpose for you. People seem to live on one of three levels. They either live in a survival mode or a success mode or a significant mode. 80% of the world lives on survival mode. They're happy just to have a meal. They're thankful just to have a roof over their head. Those of us who live in America, we're blessed. We live in a success mode. We may complain about a lot of things in life, but I tell you what, those who are in third world countries would give anything to trade their problems for ours. We're blessed people. But even through all that God has blessed us with, through all that we have, there still seems to be something lacking in people's hearts and lives, and that is something called significance. Whether you're rich or poor, have everything or have nothing, if you don't have a reason for existence, a significance in life, you don't have meaning in life, you don't have fulfillment in life. God brings us to the place where we understand significance, that he has a purpose for us. He has a plan for our lives. We're here at this time for a purpose, and we need to find out what it is and to fulfill it. And when we do that, life is fulfilled. Not only are we saved from the past, you've got a future. You got plan God's got plans for you, and he has a hope for you. And we're saved through something called grace. I love grace. I've been accused of being a grace preacher my whole life. And, you know, people have kind of said that in a way that's supposedly being demeaning, but it's not demeaning to me. It's, I'm proud of the fact that I preach grace. If it wasn't for God's grace, friends, none of us would be here. Grace means you don't deserve it, you can't earn it, and you can't buy your way into heaven. Grace is, is saying that I'm not good enough to be in a heaven because I'm not perfect, and I'm not. I stopped bat batting a thousand years ago. I'm not perfect. I need somebody else's ticket to get to heaven. I can't do it on my own. I can't work my way into this thing. I need Jesus in my life. I need somebody that will give me something called grace. Grace is when God gives you what you need, not what you deserve. Grace is when God is saying, I am going to take your problem. I'm going to make your problems my problems. Somebody put it this way. Grace is God's riches given to you at Christ's expense. Grace. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 8 it says, for, I, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. Talk about Christmas time, giving gifts. Here's the greatest gift that we can receive. It's a gift from God, not a works lest anyone should boast. When I came out of high school, I loved to swim all the time that I was growing up. I lived right next to the Spokane River. I'd go down there all the time in the summer, every single day, and I'd swim. And I, I actually was a very good swimmer. And so when I got out of high school, I wanted to be a lifeguard. And so I, I, I took all the classes that became a lifeguard. And one of the things they taught us is you can't really help a person who is drowning until they stop trying to save themselves. You can swim out there and grab a hold of them. When they got all that adrenaline going through them, they'll grab a hold of you and pull you right down with them. You got to wait for the right time when they stop trying to save themselves. Then you can save them. Grace is saying, God, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I can't save myself. I need you to save me. I need a savior. I need you, God, to come into my life and help me out. And as soon as we give up striving on our own efforts and we turn it over to the Lord, then God is going to come and help you out. Jesus Christ wants to save you. He wants to save you from your hurts. He wants to save you from your habits. He wants to save you from your hang-ups. He wants to save you for his purpose. He wants to save you by his grace. But we have to stop 
trying in her own effort to get relief and help in life and allow him by his grace to help us. The first purpose of Christmas is celebration. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy, and it's for everyone. The second purpose of Christmas is salvation. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. He's Christ the Lord. And the third one is in verse 14 of Luke chapter 2. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards all men. That's another way of saying reconciliation. What's reconciliation? Reconciliation is bringing two warring parties together. Reconciliation is bringing a broken relationship and restoring that broken relationship. That is reconciliation. So here comes Jesus, and he said, I'm going to give you peace, not as the world gives, but it's a, it's a peace that's beyond anything you understand. And it's on three levels. First level is this, is peace on a spiritual level that you have with God. The Bible says in Romans 5 and 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are doing your own thing, if you don't care what God says, you're going to do what you are going to do. You don't care what the Word of God says. You're going to live by your own lifestyle. The Bible says literally you are at war with God. Did you know that? You are at enmity with Him, which means you're warring against the God of this universe. You're saying, God, I don't need you. And by casting Him out, you're literally standing against Him. Anybody that fights God, by the way, will lose. God wants you to have peace with him. And Jesus came on the scene to somehow or another put that bridge, that gulf over that gulf there, that man and God can be one. And you can have peace spiritually with God. If you have not made peace with God, you can make peace with God because someday you will stand before a holy God and he is going to judge you on whether or not you have literally accepted Christ as your Savior or not. And he offers that to you. But the peace he gives us is also an emotional thing. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. I love that scripture. Don't worry about anything. Christmas time, you got to be kidding me. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he has done. And then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Emotionally, you can experience peace. Though everything else around you is in turmoil, you can be the peaceful one. You can have peace in your life. You can say it's all right. God is going to work it all out. You have that in your heart. Jesus offers you that. So the third level of peace there's one I want to just take a moment on, and that is in relationship. Not only is it peace that we have spiritually with God, emotionally we have in our own heart that we know God is going to see us through whatever it is we are going through in life, but we need to experience peace with one another. Relationally, we need to experience peace with one another. Once we experience God's peace, we're to be at peace with one another. Again, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. He wants us to be peacemakers. He wants us to reconcile people with one another. And one of the greatest needs in our world today is that there's people who will stand up and say, let's get together. Let's work together. Let's work together. Let's work things out. Let's come to a God that understands who we are and will bring peace into people's lives. Friends, we are on the brink of a war that's going to destroy humanity unless there's peace that comes into this world. I am very concerned about that. You got nations like Russia out there. The economy is falling flat because of people that don't like what they're doing and they're hurting them economically. But you know what they do have? They got nuclear bombs. They got a lot of war power that they could hurt a lot of people. We have the, the Muslims against the Christians, against the Jews, against the Hindus, against the Buddhists, and all these different factions and religions are fighting one another. And, and, and those who are not religious at all step back and look and say, the whole problem with the world is religion. Let's get rid of all religions and then we'll have peace. My opinion is the problem with the world is Christianity, who is to come to bring peace with people, has not done so. We've taken sides against people. We're warring against people. 
when we need to reconcile people with a holy God. Do you realize that Muslims are very religious people? They pray seven times a day. Do you pray seven times a day? They love their God, who they think is their God. They will die for who they believe their God is. The Buddhists over here, I watch them all the time. They work and work and work on that little temple over here. I mean, man, they, they, they're all the time. They love that statue out there. They bring gifts to it. They honor it. They wear special robes when they come into their sanctuaries. They say special prayers and special chants. And, and all the time, they're trying to seek inner peace in their life. It's not that they are against God or atheists. Jesus came on the scene, and he says, I have what every religion is looking for. If we get sidetracked from our purpose in life, our purpose is to reconcile people to God, to the one true God. Now, the thing that's going to open up the eyes of the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Hindus and every other religion out there is going to be definite power of God being seen through the church today. When they see there's miracles in the church today, when they hear of what is taking place, my son was telling me, where he works, he tries to testify to those people. Now, Shane was raised in my house. He was in, all the time I was in ministry, he was a little boy growing up in that, and he has seen miracle after miracle after miracle. And he's always trying to share with them the things that he has seen, that God has done, either in his life or people that we know. Many of them are very critical about that. They don't think that God can do that. But one person came in. I don't even know if he was a Christian or not. He said, it's in the news. There was a woman that died, and she came back to life. It was in the news. I guess if it's in the news, it's true, right? <laughs> like if it's on the computer, you know, it's like, ah, right on the Internet, man, it's true. And so all those guys said, well, it must be true. It must be true. And it opened up their eyes, and he had opportunity to tell them more and more about what God can do. You see, when miracles begin to happen in the church, when people are healed, lives are changed, people are raised from the dead, those who are seeking God on whatever level it is, whatever religion they're looking for, will look to Christianity and say, Christianity may be the answer. We have instead become a people of conflict. We post ourselves against people, against other religions, against other nations. That's not what we're here for. I, I'm, I may shock you with this, but you know what? You are not an American first. You're not an American first. I'm, I'm pro-America, but you are not, first of all, an American. You know why? Because Jesus said, the, the, the kingdom that I represent is not of this world. It's not of this world. It's from heaven. We represent the heavenly kingdom first. It supersedes all other kingdoms, whether that's America, Russia, any nation of Europe, Africa, South America, Central America, Mexico. We belong to the kingdom of God. And we need to bring the power of the kingdom of God back into our world today so people will see a God that came in the very beginning when Jesus came and the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill to all mankind. Every single human being, no matter what they believe, no matter where they've been, no matter what they have done, God wants us to be reconcilers to one another and bring people back together. Well, Christmas is the perfect time to show that kind of grace. It's a perfect time to be a reconciler. We're reminded of his grace. I'm going to ask you a frank question because you're going to be meeting with a lot of people this week. Who do you need to rebuild a relationship with? What has been torn? What relationship has been torn? What relationship needs to be restored? Who do you need to reconcile with? This is a great opportunity. That is really the spirit of Christmas. Peace on earth towards all men. Make reconciliation with those that you have offense with. Go to them. Make it right, or at least try to make it right. Do the right thing. To the, do the Christian thing. Jesus Christ comes to us today. He says, in all your frustrations, I can replace it. I can replace all your frustrations with peace. Jesus Christ comes to us and he says, in your guilt, all your resentment, all your shame, all your grudges, all these things, he says, I'll replace those things. I'll give you forgiveness. 
Jesus comes to us in our time of need, and he says, I'll take away all the worry, all the anxiety that you experience, and I will give you confidence, and I will give you faith. I will build you up. He can replace depression and despair with hope and replace emptiness. In a life seemingly of depression and despair and, and loneliness, he can replace all those things with meaning and purpose. He said, I'll take away your confusion. I'll give you clarity of mind. Underneath the Christmas tree are many packages. Some are bigger than others. I keep telling my grandchildren, it's a little packages, probably the best things in it. In that big package, I didn't put anything in it. Paper. <laughs> Somehow we think the bigger the package, the better it is. But in this case, the bigger the package, it truly is better. There's a gift that's awaiting for every single one of us. And Jesus Christ is in that package. And when he comes into your life, he comes with everything you have need of. Everything you have need of. He can heal your family. He can heal your heart. He can restore. He can bring good things into your life. He can give you a future and a hope. And I'm a great believer that if we really trust in the Lord and believe good things are going to happen, you know what? Good things happen. Good things happen. It's when we doubt and walk in confusion. Seemingly, that doesn't take place. But the greatest gift that is for you this Christmas is a gift that many people will never open up. And that's the one that Christmas is all about. And that's Jesus Christ. All we have to do is give him a chance. That's all we have to do. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. The Bible says, come, try me in this, the Lord said. You have need in your finances? Why don't you trust God in your finances? You have need, you need peace in your heart? Why don't you just open up your heart and say, God, I need peace in my heart. I'm tired of doing it myself. I'm tired of struggling on my own. I need you, God, to come into my heart and into my life. You got stress in your life and worry? Why don't you just say, you know what, God, I'm going to believe that it's all going to work out for good. I'm not going to worry about this one bit. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to trust you. Stop fighting and allow the Savior to come into your life and to meet you today. But here's the key. He is not going to break the door of your heart down. He does not impose himself on any person. He always waits to be invited. So we have to just step back and say, Lord, I need help in this situation. I need you to help me here, God. I can't do it on my own. I realize I've, I've done everything I can. It's not working. I need you to help me. And then if you open up that door, he will come in because the Bible says he's there knocking. And if anybody opens the door, I'll come in and I'll commune with him. I'll have dinner with him. We will eat together. You can tell me all your problems. All your needs, everything you're going through, I will hear, I will listen, and I have the answer for you. But you got to open your heart's door. Roseanne, would you please come? It's Christmas time. I trust that you remember the Lord God at this time. I trust that you remember Jesus and invite him into every aspect and every area of your life during this time. Just get your family together and say, Lord God, we thank you. We have a family. We thank you, Lord, that we have health. We thank you that no matter how many presents we have or how few presents, it doesn't matter, we have the ability to give something to another person. Thank the Lord for those things. Put God first in those areas. The Bible says he will come and he will bless you. Take time to make reconciliation. Make it right, your relationships. Make it right with somebody. I know it seems difficult, but do it anyway, because God will bless you for it. Many times our prayers are hindered because of that very issue. Make it right. I want you to pray with me. Lord, I just want to come before you this morning. And Lord, I thank you for this wonderful time of the year. As my grandson said to me last night, Lord, he said, this is the best time of the year. I feel it's the best time of the year, too. Because our hearts and our minds go to a great event, and that's you, Jesus, coming. I ask, dear Lord, that you'll come to us today. 
I invite your holy presence here in this place. And Lord, if there's those that are here that need to invite you into their lives, I'm asking, dear God, that the invitation will go to them. Conviction will come into their hearts. And dear Lord, they will say yes to you. Meet us here in our hour of need. In Jesus' name I pray. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed for a moment, please. Are you here this morning and say, Pastor, I need a Savior in my life. I need a Savior in my life. And I'm asking this Savior, Jesus, to come and help me today. Set me free today to deliver me of my past. To give me a hope and a future. I'm asking this Savior to bring His grace into my life because I realize I can't do it on my own. Would you lift your hands and say, Pastor, I need prayer. Amen. Okay. God bless you guys. Appreciate that. Amen. You need a Savior. The Savior is here for you. He's here for you. He wants to touch you this morning. Will you open up your heart and say yes to Him? That's all you have to do is say yes to Him. And He will come running to you. Oh, what a good God we serve. What a blessed Redeemer He is. He sees our needs and He meets those needs before we even ask. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus. Say it again. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need a Savior. And I need a Savior today. Come into my life. Restore my heart. Give me peace. I accept your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to tell you something. I feel this in the Spirit. God wants is going to start doing something for you. You're going to see things that are just going to change. You're going down a road and a pathway where it seems like, man, am I ever going to get out of this rut? You know, somebody said a rut is a grave with an ants knocked out of it. And you feel like you're in a grave. You feel like, man, if I keep going down this same path, the same road, it's like death. God's going to take you out of that. I believe that. I believe he's going to reach down, he's going to pull you out, and he's going to set you on high ground. He's going to give you a new direction. He's going to help you through some of those problems you're going through. He's going to minister life to you because he's a good God. He's a good God. He comes with salvation. 2015 is going to be a banner year for you. It's going to be the best you ever have had. And you need to expect God is going to bless you in every single way, and he's going to prosper you because that's the kind of God we serve. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Come on up here if you need prayer. We'll pray with you, minister to you. We got church tonight at 5 o'clock. Moses is here speaking. Tell you what, he's, he's got some good material. He's been preaching here lately. Good stuff. One of these days he's going to convict me. I'm going to respond. It's good stuff he's preaching. You need to come and hear it. God bless you if you need to go. Don't forget your calendar that's out there.